And for our final talk of this chunk, and after this, we'll do breakout discussions. Uh, welcome, Alex. Hello. Yes, Alex Burke, programmer and designer, been in the industry for 14 years and worked in Denmark and the UK. Uh, mm -hmm. Work at the intersection of procedural generation, graphics programming, and how to create fun and expressive workflows for devs and players alike. Uh, you've worked on things like 11, 11, Memories Retold, Power Wash Simulator, and uh, lead level creator on What the Car, which I think is great. And uh, yeah, here to talk about Sea of Rifts. Yes, um, that's what I'm uh, about to talk about. And uh, I did have a slide presenting all of that stuff, but since we are a bit short on time, I'm just going to skip that and go straight to the game. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, Sea of Rifts, which is a roguelike combining uh, with the like mechanics of a story generator. Um, in the game, you take on the role of a captain heading out into this uh, hostile world that is slowly being torn apart by these rifts into other dimensions. On your journey, you take a, a crew of procedurally generated characters and uh, horrible things and interesting stuff happens uh, along the way to both you uh, and your crew. Um, when you uh, are not out uh, exploring this uh, hostile world, you return back to port and in port you can repair your ship and upgrade it. And this is also where you hire on crew members. Crew members are also generated from a bunch of uh, character traits we pick at random. They both define like how the character's personality is, but also what their capabilities are. What is not generated is um, my own crew. Uh, we are quite small a uh, group of people making this game. And I'm also the main programmer on the game as, part, as well as being like the uh, creative uh, director on the project. So it's um, like, I have to be quite uh, like efficient and practical in how I make the game and uh, also trying to get like as much of the team to uh, like contribute into it directly. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So the agenda is going to be uh, best practices for using procedural generation in a commercial game. It's uh, how we generate the world and uh, level in the game. And then I'm also going to talk about story and character generation and a little bit more pipeline and uh, editor specific stuff. All right. So first I'm going to talk about random number generators or rather that we don't actually use them. Um, I found that hash and noise uh, methods are way better than traditional RNGs. They produce a higher quality of uh, output than like, for example, the random number generator you can find in Unity. Uh, it has no state, which is super beneficial because it means that you can always get the same number out if you just have the same uh, like position into your noise uh, method. Um, that means that they're thread safe. And that means that you can also like put them over on the GPU really easily if you need to at some point, at some point like port some of your code over to run there. And it's also easy to extend into multiple dimensions. And I don't really see a, a use case for why you would use uh, traditional RNGs. Maybe there is one, but I, I don't know. So yeah, noise is noise. Another thing that's also super important is that you need to make sure that your generation is uh, deterministic. Um, you might have a player that will encounter a bug when we are generating a whole world and like narrative and characters, it's bound to happen. And if you can't recreate the like the same state of the game that your player is in, then it's impossible to track down what actually happened. And that is um, also tied into this concept I call uh, layer caking. It's similar to like composition in um, like object oriented programming uh, patterns. It's it's basically that you have a generator for each aspect of the game. This means that you can take out a generator and you can like tweak it. Uh, it also makes it easier to read because like the responsibility of what the generator does is much more like well-defined than if it was just like one big smudge of uh, spaghetti code that did all the, the generation. In our game, it looks like this. We have the world generator that uh, has uh, like the master seed of the whole world. And that in turn then seeds each uh, sub generator. And we have two types of uh, generators. We have the, those that generate like cells in the world. And we also just have like the concept of uh, a generator in, in a more abstract sense that's used for stuff, for example, like, uh, like names in the game. And um, this means that it's actually quite easy for us to like add more generators into the game without changing the output of what was uh, done before. I also want to touch a bit on state. Um, 
So I would say like the hottest thing in procedural generation uh, right now seems to be a wave function collapse, where it's basically like a constraint solver. And I think it's it has its problems like uh, making games this way. Um, like in our case, uh, we can't really use it because we want to always be able to like teleport to an arbitrary point in the world. That's both for like uh, debugging purposes. It's really nice to just be able to say, I'm gonna spawn in here. Um, but we also have gameplay uh, that takes uh, like where the player can teleport around. And uh, the problem with something like uh, wave function collapse is that you uh, need to like start from an initial state um, and then like your generation basically like uh, like grows out for outwards from that point. Um, and that's not something that really fits uh, our use case. I've also seen um, like procedural games in the past, uh, like ha like take a long time to basically generate the the world before you can start playing in it. Um, we do have like a world generation like uh, state uh, when you start up an instance of the game, but it's super short because it doesn't generate that much data, and then most of the 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 data is actually generated each time you enter a cell, and that just makes it much much easier for us to uh, iterate on the game. So, as uh, I was being introduced, um, I really like uh, like graphics programming. I think it's super fun, and that's also something we're using a lot in like how we make the game. So, for example, for um, like stuff that is static in the environment, we have this shader that allows us to uh, easily do some color randomization on them. Because we have a streaming world setup, the X and Z coordinates uh, of everything can like shift around. So the only two constants we have is the uh, rotation of the object and the, the height. So we take those and basically generate a like randomized value, um, like a static randomized value of each object, and we then use that to like add some like uh, color variation. This is uh, a little bit fake, like real pine trees, for example. Like they actually have the same color, uh, but. Uh, it helps like giving that perceptual difference to them that we didn't otherwise have. For um, more like uh, human-made objects, uh, we have this HSV system where we can take an asset that wasn't initially like created for procedural generation, so that includes stuff from that asset store, and then we can define this uh, texture map where like a given area of the model, for example, like the hull on the ship, will get one uh, specific HSV offset. So we basically convert convert from RGB over to HSV, apply the offset, and then convert back to RGB again. And this allows us to, again, like get a lot more visual variation uh, out of a few amount of assets. I would also say like one of the first things you should do if, you, if you're doing any kind of game, but especially something that's like systemic, um, you need like a deb uh, debug menu where you can easily add in uh, commands that uh, like benefits the team. So we have this where we can basically uh, put in a path and then uh, like all of the commands is like structured into this like tree structure um, or like uh, yeah, all the, the debug uh, options are like basically put inside like these uh, buttons with folders and you can um, like we can very easily add more commands that way into uh, the game. Because it's a procedural game, we don't actually have a scene to really inspect. So if something goes wrong, it's uh, quite e like quite handy to be able to visualize it, uh, like what the generation is actually doing. And um, I had, like needed a place to like basically like show this to us as we were developing. We have a map in the game. Might as well use that. So uh, that's what you see here. Sometimes it corresponds to the player's position, and sometimes it's just completely arbitrary what uh, what is being shown. A recent addition I'm really excited about is we have a debug console in the game now, so we can text, take text input. Um, and that also um, it talks together to this uh, console input component that we can add onto game objects uh, inside our Unity scene. When that uh, component gets enabled, it just injects all of that text into the debug console. And um, that allows us to basically rerun the same conditions again and again if we are like fixing a bug or iterating on a system. Um, what I think is, is even more exciting is because we can take text input now, we can actually uh, use the Elgato Stream Deck. Um, that has the ability to send in text as a, like a macro command when you click a button. And this has allowed uh, like individual um, team members to basically make their own debug menu 
outside of the game. And I find that it's um, like on a given task, I will actually like um, create a little like customized workflow depending on what I'm doing right now. And um, yeah, it's super handy. All right, then we have world and land generation. So uh, to start with, we uh, did a very standard thing of um, like having layers of uh, Perlin noise that created a height map. And we did this in uh, two uh, like magnitudes. We had uh, world cells and we also had like the, the lands contour when you are inside like a cell of the generation. Um, this worked okay. Like we got some uh, like islands and uh, like uh, co continents that looked uh, fairly realistic. But I think like if you know what you're looking at, like you'll always be like, yeah, I can definitely see like two layers of pearly noise on, on top of each other here. And it also had some other uh, not <laughs> so good uh, uh, effects. Um, we had lakes and sometimes you would get stuck in a lake. Um, which was like a very sad way of uh, both starting and then very quickly ending your, your run. Also, you couldn't really balance the generation very well because it was just based on like layers of noise. There wasn't any concept of what actually makes the level good to play. Um, so here, for example, like the player stuck in the middle of nowhere and can't really easily progress in the game. And that's kind of like uh, a, a takeaway I want you to have from this talk is that like you need to understand um, the pattern of what you're generating like how should it play what should it look like and just as important where can you cheat like you don't need to like generate the like a real world in order to to make your game work or like your visuals work you just have to like figure out what is actually like the key part of the experience or the key part of the the visuals um, that we need. And uh, I have an example of that uh, later. But and if it's something that you think is interesting, then uh, the timeless way of building. Um, if you have read uh, Jesse Schell's um, game design book on, on like lenses and also like software patterns, all of that is actually based on this book. Um, super interesting read. OK. So what did we re re replace the Perlin noise with? Um, the first thing is that we needed a better like player goal. So it ended up being that you have to get to the center of the world. That's where it fell apart. And um, that also lent itself well to having this, like basically organizing the whole world as a big uh, circle. And we uh, then generate these uh, like zones. Uh, green zones can contain islands with harbors. Blues can contain these uh, rifts into other dimensions. And uh, the red circles, they will always contain a rift. And this structure, me structure means that every time the player wants to progress further to the like, main objective of getting to the center, they will have to, at some point, sail through a uh, rift in, in order to uh, succeed in that. And that allows us to also control the, like, the difficulty. It's basically just a question of like how close to the center of the world is the player. Oops. As you can see, it's also easier for like a lot easier to actually adjust the like how the map looks like and all the parameters for how the map is generated is tied into gameplay. Um, like what is the distance between the, the harbors? Like how big are like these uh, island zones? How big are the rift zones? And like is like what is the progression in uh, like length of getting through those uh, rift zones as you get closer to the center? Um, instead of just being like layers of Perlin noise, this actually has something to do with the game. Okay, so that takes care of the like the world. Now let's talk about islands. So. <laughs> The, my main goal was that I, we needed to have a clear boundary between land and sea. Like uh, sea is where the player can move. Land is basically like uh, like blocking uh, areas. We don't want any sea pockets inside of uh, like land. And we also wanted to be so harbors are actually the the like the, the data that determines where there is land because we like harbors are key gameplay objects. Uh, land is like for mo for the most part just there, there to sell the the fiction um and we also want to it to harbor cells are always connected with at least one edge to a water cell so they are traversable for the player and what we do is that we basically uh, take a random uh, direction from the harbor cell and we we uh, denote that as the like entrance corridor so no land can be placed there then based on the size of the harbor we say uh, 
a certain amount of cells uh, surrounding it should be land. And then we basically grow out from, uh, from the harbor cell, uh, like land cells. And then at the very end, we, we then uh, take cells that are at a certain distance away from those uh, land or harbor cell and turn that into uh, coastal waters, which is like the biome that are, are like close to land. And um, yeah, that that kind of like leads us to the last part, and that is how do we then like create an interesting like contour for the islands? And um, I came up with this idea of using uh, signed distance fields based on splines. So basically, we um, we take the the <laughs> the world seed and the the coordinates uh, of uh, each cell, and we look at uh, how it's connected to its neighbors. And based on that, we then generate these um, uh, Bezier splines that uh, connect up. So we also make sure that there is uh, a continuity between the splines that uh, goes from uh, one cell and uh, into the next. And um, yeah, uh, this was by far like the trickiest part to actually figure out. Um, I'll see if I have some more time to go into it afterwards, but uh, yeah, um, it ended up working in the end. Something that's way simpler is how we spawn uh, scenery in the game. So we basically just use uh, as like standard blue noise distribution, we generate a grid and inside the, each grid cell, we have a, like a randomized offset. Um, what makes it look good is that we um, have like a layered approach. So we, again, like here we have like this layer caking inside each of our biome uh, setting files. We have a list of uh, scenery rules that are applied in sequence, and then each sequence rules uh, have um, like a specific algorithm that it uses to spawn, and then like a specific uh, like uh, set of data for how the algorithm should be used. The most interesting like scenery rule we have is definitely like for uh, for cities uh, and like harbors. Um, what I do there, and and this is like where it comes down to like actually understanding the pattern and, and where you can cheat. Uh, I just generate a grid and then I offset each uh, grid point uh, by a random amount, and it's it's inspired a little bit by like how like real cities look like i don't have that like fractalism that you see in a real city where like smaller uh, like bigger streets lead into smaller streets that leads to an even like smaller streets but the thing is because of the camera we have in the game you we don't really need that level of detail in the generation it's it's good enough uh, like if the player can read it as a city and also if they can start to see that each harbor city is different then that that's good enough for for what we need Okay, then uh, we come to uh, how we generate narrative. Um, this is like the area where we are trying to be very efficient and also reusing a lot of existing solutions out there. Um, so for example, for uh, conversation topics that can happen between the crew as you're sailing around, we, we are just picking from like long lists of uh, topics. Uh, you can probably guess that uh, it's all the insults on the, the right. Um, and this is uh, good enough because they don't happen like that often to create that sense of like the crew is actually like in engaging with each other. For ship names, we uh, combine an adjective with uh, one of these names we found in uh, on Wikipedia from uh, the Royal British Navy. Um, especially uh, a thing I love is like it took them a while to apparently get uh, the HMS impregnable to live up to its name. So they had to like do a couple of tries, but uh, I, I guess they got there in the end. We also use uh, Tracery, uh, which I'm sure many of you know. Um, we do use some custom macros that allows us to inject more of the game state into the generated text. And uh, we also use uh, phoneme generators where we have basically taken a bunch of uh, Danish city names, uh, chopped them up, and then uh, we concatenate them. And that creates, uh, that, that works surprisingly well for generating uh, names that feels Scandinavian in nature. For choice-based uh, like narrative, we use uh, Ink, um, open source, great tool. What we've then ad added on top is this uh, in-house uh, data structure uh, and an editor inside Unity that basically layers uh, or like like exists next to the Ink file, and that allows us to affect the game state based on the choices the player make. But it also allows us to uh, 
uh, turn choices off if, uh, for example, the player doesn't have the right uh, crew on board. And it also allows us to pick uh, like a random choice or a choice based on a skill check. In general, I really like using uh, custom editors in Unity. It's super easy to uh, write them and they have the, uh, the benefit that like the tool itself like shows more of like the structure of how you should actually do it um like if we had it so our narrative designer and i had to uh, put in the data in xml it would be much more error prone because um, any data kind of like goes into text but if it's a gui like there is a structure to it and you can like enforce what kind of uh, like input a given field uh, takes um so yeah it's um something i, I really enjoy doing so uh, this is also where we have a like a quite a simple uh, workflow, um, but like quite effective. And that is we, in order to make sure that we don't have any merge conflicts, um, we have the problem that the whole game takes place in one scene in Unity. And uh, the way we get around that is that we uh, we all work in separate branches. Uh, I work in the main branch, and I have the like the game scene to myself. And then everyone else in the project takes a copy of the game scene like at regular intervals and like name it after themselves. And then if the game scene is uh, out of sync, like it's it's too old, uh, they will get a warning um, in the console. And it may or may not be a problem, but if they are encountering problems, then they know that they need to uh, overwrite the scene with the, the canonical version of the game scene. We also uh, making sure to split our assets up as uh, much as possible uh, inside Unity. That also reduces merge conflicts and means that team team members from different disciplines are less likely to touch the same assets. So for characters, we uh, also have this uh, kind of like paper doll system, where um, we have like a set of uh, like color gradients we can pick colors from, and we have a set of um, sprites for ears noses and so on that are added on top of it and even though we don't have a huge amount of uh, sprites because of the color variation uh, we are surprised ourselves like how much variation we actually get in our crew portraits and uh, the reason why we also have this like a more data-driven approach to how the portraits look is that as you are progressing in the game your crew can be affected by all the strange energies uh, that are in the world and slowly like change and become more and more shaped by the the weird uh, uh, energies of uh, traversing the sea of rifts okay so to summarize um noise methods are super nice i encourage you to use them if you do uh, using a proc gen in a production make sure that it's deterministic make sure that it's layered and make sure that it's flexible so you can easily change stuff based on player feedback uh, write your generators with a focus on the player experience and also a simple solution with good design and good content is always better than having like some kind of like clever algorithm but like not actually having thought of like what goes into it um, use existing tools where you can like if you're making a commercial game, like you need to think about actually like shipping at some point and you need good workflow and development tools uh, for yourself, but also to enable your whole team to contribute to the game. I have a bunch of uh, resources that you can also check out uh, that inspired uh, this talk. Um, I posted on the obelisk, uh, so you can check it out there. And uh, yeah, uh, thanks for listening and um, thanks for a roguelike celebration for uh, letting me speak and uh, including us in the, the Steam sale. Um, we have a uh, playable demo up on Steam right now. So if you're interested in trying out the game, uh, please uh, yeah, follow the links. Oh, Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, fantastic. I think it was kind of like a an all-star, like so many of the topics and algorithms and techniques we have had at some point of Roguelike Celebration talk just on that. But it's so cool to see all of them come into context of how all of this information can be brought together to make a cohesive, interesting game. Thanks. So, yeah, we have time probably for a question or two if anyone wants to get one up. One was just clarifying in the GitHub uh, example. So is it you're able to avoid merge conflicts because everything has to kind of be handled in separate copies? Most of the time, yeah. So basically, um... If you take the case that your whole game was like one big file, like you would have merge conflicts all the time when you tried to 
to push to the repo. The more you split it up into separate files, the less likely you are to have like collisions on having worked on the same file. Um, and especially if the, that file structure is based on the role of each team member. Like, so most of the narrative uh, content is like in separate um, scriptable object uh, asset files. So that means that our narrative designer doesn't have to touch our prefabs, unit, unit terminology. Um, and that means that like in terms of like doing the, the gameplay and the generation, we, we don't uh, step on each other's toes. Great. No, that makes total sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I am curious. So, you know, you mentioned some issues with uh, WFC or actually, you know what? You're a pretty small team. So I am curious, you use all these different techniques. How do you make, how do you have people who know all these techniques well enough to apply them? Is it because <laughs> since you're not having to go to like expert, is it just because you personally love them all so much? It, it's is just, it's it? just me. It's, it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we are starting to have like more programmers uh, like on and off, but then they focus on like um, parts of the game that hasn't to do with the generation. Um, so the generation is just me. It does also help that uh, Fergus Doyle, my narrative designer, is also quite good on the technical side. So like uh, he had already done some tracery and he'd done some some ink. So like all of that stuff, like uh, it was basic. That that's also like the benefit of using something that's already existing, right? Like there's a good chance that the rest of the team can can already know about it. Yeah, no, that's a great point. That's something I run into a lot of. If you write a custom solution, you can't hire anyone who knows how to use your custom yeah. solution. So, uh, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Alex. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to checking out Sea of Riffs. I saw you also have procedurally generated sea shanties, which I don't think came up, but uh, was enough to sell me on the game personally. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for joining us.